Yeah, welcome to our uh, founders uh, day. And uh, I did have some notes which I put down over there, so I'm probably just going to read them. Maybe. Um, so just uh, just say that it's this uh, the Abbey has been in existence in its sort of current form as a re uh, retreat centre for uh, some 36 years now. So uh, it's it's sort of uh, quite nice that we we can continue on uh, doing these sorts of lectures. So um, the, the people who started this place uh, were Fred Bloom and uh, Stephen Burney. And so really this, this day is just to recognise the, uh, the contributions <coughs> into um, thinking about what a place like this would be about and also the type of work that they were involved in. So what they did was a lot of uh, connectivity between uh, psychology and spirituality, particularly Christianity. Uh, and pulled, pulled that all together. And the, uh, the, what they both recognized, <coughs> and this is back in the early 70s now I'm talking about, was that there was a, a growth in human consciousness. So uh, they got together and this place uh, was opened to try and uh, help and support that growth in human consciousness. So it's... Uh, Apart from anything, it's, it, it's sort of just nice to know that, that there's a, a place like this around. So, uh, it's, it's great. Um, and just to, this is where I, I will have to sort of rely on my notes, I suspect. So, uh, so Mark is Emeritus Professor uh, of Psychology at the uh, University of Oxford, uh, and just, just uh, retired as the director of the, the Mindfulness Centre. And uh, so he's uh, well in, if you, like, if you like, what we try to do when we invite anybody to come and talk, particularly on the Founders Day, is to uh, sort of institute some continuation of the type of work, at least, that uh, Fred and Stephen uh, were doing. So uh, Mark is well in that frame. Uh, and what he's going to talk about in terms of mindfulness, I'm not sure because I haven't actually <coughs> heard what he has to say. So, um, in order that you do, I'm just going to shut up and sit down. <laughs> so, to the fact that you're sitting. So just notice this posture that you're in and notice the, perhaps the sense of your feet being on the ground. But not thinking about your feet, but see if it's possible to bring your attention almost inside your feet so that you can feel whatever there is to be felt. Maybe tingling or whatever, or no sensation at all, that's perfectly fine. So whatever your experience is, and just register it. There may be some sensations that change from moment to moment, others that stay the same. See if you can be aware of, of this too. And then allowing that sense of attentiveness to just move up the body from the soles of the feet to the rest of the feet. And then to the lower leg. The upper leg. The air around the waist. Perhaps noticing the pressure of the, of the sitting on the chair or the stool, whatever you're sitting And then the sense of the spine lifting out of the reach of the waist, the torso, allowing the shoulders to drop, the hands and arms, both hands, both arms. <coughs> and something as well. 
down to the neck and the head in place. And see if it's possible just to simply sit here, noticing the sensations in the body just as they are, not trying to look for anything to happen, nothing special, no, nothing to achieve. Allowing things to be as they are in this moment. A sense of coming home to the body. And you may notice from time to time the mind runs away somewhere else, apart from where you intended it to be on the body, on the sensations in the body. And just you notice that, simply acknowledge it, and without any sense of blame, just as walking the attention back to the body, back to this moment in the body. So no success or failure, not even trying to relax, just simply uh, noticing moment by moment what sensations are around in the body, and by extension, what distractions there may be, and when the mind goes off, simply escorting it gently back. A lot of people think meditation or mindfulness is about clearing the mind, um, but no, the mind doesn't usually like to be cleared out. Um, thoughts just keep coming back. So it's about seeing and holding the thoughts that come and go, rather than trying to do anything special with them or clear them out or uh, end the stillness or peace. The stillness which, which we speak of in mindfulness is the stillness of allowing things to be as they are and holding them in a larger space, rather than the stillness of the sweeping brush that tries to sweep everything clean. And that's a difference that perhaps we'll come back to again and again. So I was sitting with um, uh, a colleague at the end of the day in which we'd been, we, we were supposed to examine a PhD the very next day and he'd met me at the station and we'd walked to the hotel and we were just reflecting on the walk and I was talking about how useful it was to have one of these cases with wheels on that pulls along. It was rather noisy because there was a lot of cobbles in the city where we were examining this PhD. Um, but despite the noise, it's still very useful to have the wheels on the suitcase. And he observed dryly that um, we put a man on the moon uh, before we actually thought of putting wheels on suitcases. <laughs> and, and my mind went back. I could, it's very interesting that. The, the pace of evolution is very strange to me. But my mind went back to a scene, um, uh, instantaneous recall, a scene uh, that had happened to me on Schiphol Airport. Um, uh, Schiphol in Amsterdam is uh, one of these lovely modern airports that. Uh, uh, Heathrow aspires to become. Uh, it's all lovely marble and uh, elegance. Um, and I don't usually like airports, but Schiphol is, uh, is, expensive. Um, is an exception. Anyway, the train station is underneath the airport concourse. Mm. And they hit upon the plan that instead of having escalators down to the platforms, they have a moving walkway, such as you get in most airports, but the moving walkway at certain points just begins to go down and descend which is great, unless, as this young man in front of me had, he had one of these rather well-engineered suitcases with wheels. They had a wheel on four corners, which must have looked great in the showroom. Um, but as this, we started to go down, his larger suitcase, in fact, just escaped and started trundling off without him down the walkway. I said to him, I'll hold you on the bag. You better go after it. And I last saw him disappearing, actually, he disappeared around the corner. And by the time I got onto the platform, uh, he was standing on the edge of the line, the edge of the platform, because his case had 
gone down, had gone straight up the platform, was now lying on the railway line. <laughs> so we looked around for somebody to come and help, somebody with a uniform, or well, they don't use uniforms in, in the Netherlands, but somebody who looked like they might be in charge. And we couldn't find anybody. Luckily, mid-morning, so nobody on the platform, nobody had been hit by this flying suitcase, this crummy suitcase. And as we stood there looking, we started looking to see whether there was an electric rail. Not that we knew anything about this at all, of course. Um, but we reckoned that these would look like ordinary rail, rail, railways, railway lines. Probably it was safe. And I summoned up all the bravery I could and said to him, you better go down. <laughs> So just to give an outline of what I want to speak, I want to talk about what is mindfulness, describe it briefly and where it come from, about why it's useful, why is it needed, why it's become so popular uh, over the last 20 years. We can hardly open a magazine now which doesn't mention either mindfulness is the panacea that's going to help us all with everything, or mindfulness is the worst thing that you ever saw. Stay away from it, it's very dangerous. Um, uh, somebody somewhere has got something to say about this. And then how does all that relate to this little book uh, published in the mid-1980s, Water into Wine, uh, by one of the founders of this urban community. And then I want to go back from the Water into Wine into psychology and mindfulness, and to talk a little bit about what are the barriers to the sort of transformation that is laid out uh, in the Water into Wine uh, book. And then perhaps finally what are the practical implications for us, and perhaps a couple of meditations along the way. So, starting off then, what is mindfulness? I mean, mindfulness itself is a translation of, of a Pali word. Um, Pali, very close to Sanskrit, the, the language in which the Buddhist scriptures were written down about 300 years after the historical Buddha had lived. And the word sati is one of the most commonly occurring words in the Buddhist uh, sutras. And uh, related to the Sanskrit word smriti, meaning memory, it came in Pali to refer yes, to memory, but also to, through memory, to recollection, to gathering together what had been dispersed in memory and in other aspects of the mind. And that gathering together uh, became known probably better as uh, a word that refers to awareness, a sort of, you might say, non-forgetfulness. Mindfulness means not forgetting where we are, not forgetting what we're doing, not being on autopilot so much of the time that we miss our lives. And waking up, after all, Buddhism just means wake up, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Waking up and checking in with ourselves to see what's going on in the outside world and the inside world, and having more freedom that comes from realizing where we are and what we're doing, rather than just letting life uh, control us. So all of us are, to some extent, mindful all of the time. But a lot of the time, we're being mindless as well. And it's, it's actually navigating a path through that that mindfulness helps us to do, usually cultivated uh, traditionally over the last two and a half thousand years by meditation. Um, just finding a little time each day when you can cultivate the art of stillness, <coughs> the sense of just waking up again and again and again when the mind takes us off into distraction. 
And it's become popular over the last few years, I guess, because uh, the anecdotes over the centuries about how useful this, how useful this was, um, have been validated by science, by both clinical trials uh, that have shown that uh, mindfulness is very helpful in the transformation of destructive emotions. Uh, our own work is on just depression and recurrent depression, and showing uh, that uh, you seem to be able to do mindfulness, an eight-week course of mindfulness based cognitive therapy, um, and it halves the rates of depression for the most recurrent uh, uh, of, the, uh, of, of depression. That's the sort of depression that keeps coming back. Um, even when nothing bad happens, depression can threaten to come back. An important thing now, and attracting the interest of the government, um, not just because uh, my colleague has trained a lot of people in Parliament to, 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 on an eight-week mindfulness course, but also because they realise that now um, depression starts very young. The, the, need, the modal age, the most common age for people to become seriously clinically depressed for the first time is between 13 and 15 years of age. Um, and it's true now of all mental illness, as, as my colleague, of all forms of mental illness that anyone will ever get, 75% has occurred before the age of 24, and 50% before the age of 18. So there's a huge interest now to see if it's possible to do something with people that is not medicalizing them or making them feel stigmatized and saying, oh, have you got a problem, right? We need to sort you out. But enabling them to do something really simple, which is as simple as just training the mind to attend, which turns out, as we found in our trials, to be very helpful, both in preventing recurrent depression, but also in the uh, pilot trials we've done, preventing the very first onset of and that's what I now spend much of my time doing, is thinking about how to introduce this for, for people, uh, even before they become depressed for the first time, but doing so in a way that doesn't stigmatize. And classroom-based mindfulness seems to be what children really enjoy doing. So transforming destructive emotions even before they've started is one major theme and why mindfulness has become interesting popular. But I think the other thing is that mindfulness has become popular amongst people who've never had any um, brush with uh, mental instability or illness at all, just as a way of getting back in touch with life, of re-engaging with moment-to-moment -moment living, of living life to the full. And this is another thing which people say, this has transformed my life. Um, somebody once said to us, I feel like a hippie in the 1960s. I'm not sure that's the best outlet for mindfulness. Um, um, off to Woodstock and free love. I don't think that's what they meant. I think they meant they discovered something which they never ever thought was possible in their ordinary humdrum life. And so these, um, this mainstream version or secular version of an ancient spiritual exercise or gathering together in spiritual exercises has been for many people um, a, a very great, a very great uh, help to them. But then the question for tonight is how does this relate then to water into wine? this book um, that Stephen Burney uh, wrote in the 1980s. Christianity, after all, talks about, Christ uh, about transformation. Um, and yet Christianity, certainly in the West, has become less and less popular, even as other faiths seem to have got more and more popular in the rest of the world. I was watching a TED talk the other night about um, religion. Uh, TED talks are these things you can download. They're all on YouTube, and if you just put TED talk into it, Google search engine, you get all these little 15-minute talks by the good and the great around the world. Anyway, this one is about religion. And this guy started by asking his large audience how many people would consider themselves religious. And a few little hands went up. He reckoned it must have been about 3% of the audience. And then he asked, how many of you would consider yourself a spiritual person? And virtually everybody's hand went up. So this disjunction between uh, this idea of myself or others as religious, which is mm, not very well valued, and myself as a spiritual person on the on the spiritual path of some of some sort, seems to be a, a big disjunction that is uh, happening at the moment. People seem to be suspicious of the claims that religious people make, often associating religion with a sort of an assertion that I'm right, a set of dogmas, 
a set of having to believe six impossible things before breakfast <coughs> and, and tell other people that you have to believe them too. Of taking the Bible literally, for example, of saying, you know, you've got to believe what's there because it says it's true. But it's interesting that what Stephen Byrne points out in his book on St. John's Gospel is that that's one part of the Bible, this fourth gospel, where the gospel writer seems to take head on the idea that if you want to be religious, you have to believe everything literally. In fact, the whole theme, you might say, of that gospel um, is that if you take things literally, you miss the point. And that's the job of that little book. And it's just been republished. So it's available again. I think it had to be republished because I know a few of us in this room have just, as it were, wiped out all second-hand bookshops and all internet, of all spare copies of Walking the Bomb. Um, you can't easily find it now, even through Google. Um, and I'm sorry that I'm part of the problem because I <laughs> bought them all up and give them to friends and family over the years. But now it's been republished, so we can read it all again. The point is that when you read that book, the ideas are as fresh as if the ink was still wet on it as if it had just, as if Stephen Burney had just laid his pen aside and said, you know, here, take a look at this. Because what he's doing, he's actually giving uh, a lifetime of his reflections about the fourth gospel. And he's living inside it, and then having reflected on it all these years, is saying, this is what I make of it. And at the end he says, now it's over to you. Read it again. And he takes his episodes from St. John's gospel and brings them and I, I remember reading it when my colleague Fraser Watts, who's here in the audience, gave it, gave it to me for the first time and showed me about it, showed me this book. I remember falling in love with it even in the introduction. He starts with a letter to the reader. And he records walking with his wife Sandra in the garden of a friend, looking at their rhododendrons. And uh, his neighbor says, what are you up to? And he says, I'm writing a book about St. John's Gospel. And then, in his enthusiasm, um, he says, as he says in his letter to the reader, um, why I'm enthusiastic? Because St. John was answering the questions that people are asking today as they search for the truth about themselves and about love and about God. John, he says, opens our eyes to a universe in which outward things are alive with an inner meaning and glory. So he's talking about not stopping at the outward looking beyond them to their inner glory. And so he points out in this book how St. John actually subverts the idea of taking things too literally. And he does this by showing that if you take the acts and words of Jesus literally, you miss the point. He does it by actually telling stories in which people misunderstand so grossly that you can't stop, but you can't um, but, but take the right message. So, for example, we have the story about Nicodemus, who comes to Jesus in the middle of the night and says, and they have this conversation, and Jesus at one point says, unless you are born again, you can't enter the kingdom. And Nicodemus goes, ugh, what? Well, I guess he must have. Must I be born again and enter my mother's womb? Ugh. I mean, you know, it doesn't even bear thinking about it, does it, really? He's a Pharisee, after all. But even for any of us, a grown man, this is... So, completely missing the point. And then conversation with a Samaritan woman at the well. He's a lone man, she's a lone woman, they have a bit of a thing going on here because she's actually had four or five husbands and she's not currently living with her husband, the man she's married with isn't, you know, I mean, it's not the sort of person you want to actually have a long conversation with at the well. Um, but anyway, this conversation happens and um, he asks for a drink, she says, who are you to ask me for a drink? And then they get into a conversation and he talks about the living water living water that, that he could give where you'd never thirst again. And she says, oh great, I won't have to come to the well. <coughs> In fact, it's a new people like you. Who knows? I won't have to come to the well. So completely missing the point. And it's in, and the whole point is then, you take that and you look at St. John's Gospel through the eyes of how easy it is to miss the point. How easy it is to get into, did this really happen or not? And if it didn't happen, then there's nothing to be, um, and you can do that with all of them, including resurrection stories. Did this really happen or not? Or actually, is 
what's being done here, what's being offered, a transformation which you can have now? And if so, what's that about? That's the joy. That's the joy in this thing. So what Stephen does is say, look, this is sort of written in code. And so let's try and crack the code. And one of the code words, or the code pairs he talks about, is the up and down. Anno and Tacto, these two Greek words. He said, look for those Greek words. I mean, you can get interlinear New Testament now online. Look for those Greek words, or words that, that include them, and then insert it using you from one use of these to the other. Then you begin, what emerges is two realms, two orders, heaven and earth, let's call them, or heaven, the kingdom, and the cosmos, earth. And the idea is look for the way in which what St. John is saying is that these divided um, realms need to be joined together. And that's the point of the water in the wine story. So again, you could say of the water in the wine story, did this really happen? And we've already seen that that's the wrong question. But water in the wine, I mean, it's an event. It happened early on in the life of Jesus of Nazareth. As it's told, simple story. He turns up at the wedding with some of his disciples. His mother's already there, as happens with people who turn up late for weddings. His mother's already there. She's noticed the wine has run out. She says, the wine's run out, Jesus. And he says, what's that to do with us, with you and me? And she just ignores what he says and <coughs> says, just do what he says to the servants. So, as the servants go, so he says, okay, those water jars over there, the water jars of purification, you know, the old way, purifying, uh, they each held 20 or 30 gallons. So quite a big party, you might think, when Jesus is told to go into the wine. 20 or gallons, he said, fill them to, fill them to the brim. Water represents the old, old way our old selves. But to fill them to the brim, fill yourself to the brim. Don't think, oh, it's all code based, but fill your life to the brim. And then draw some water off. They take it to the master of the feast, who says, this is great wine. And he goes to the bridegroom and he says, you have done an amazing thing. Most people don't serve the best wine until everybody's drunk. Or rather, they serve best wine first, then the plonk, and everybody's drunk. And you have left the best wine until best wine is exactly now. Now we begin to see echoes of mindfulness. We begin to see echoes of coming back to the present moment. We get a sort of a sense of, ah, something is going to happen if we can really help ourselves to let go of something in order to be able to be aware of just exactly now. So why is this important? Well, you say miracle. John calls them signs, something that points beyond itself. And just in case you didn't notice, John says this was the first of the signs that Jesus did. But the word for first isn't just first, second, third. The word is arche, arche, like the, as in archetype, archaeology, archbishop. It's the principal or ruling sign. It's the fundamental sign. It's the archetypal sign. So this water into wine is the archetypal sign. So you look back at the story and you say, well, what's archetypal about it? And then you suddenly realize that at the beginning of the story, it says, and on the third day, there was a marriage. You think, and on the third day, now if you're into Christianity a bit, you'll know that if anybody starts a sentence with, and on the third day, it doesn't refer to anything other than one event. And that's what happened we know the resurrection and a stasis, the standing up again, the revival, the standing up again, and on the third day. So this archetypal sign is saying, carry this theme forward to another third day, and what you begin to hear the resonances just beginning to glimpse is that the whole meaning of this third day was a sort of a marriage, a marriage between up and down, a heavenly realm cosmos that what is Jesus' mission is all about is uniting these two realms. And the whole of this story, this is the first archetypal sign, but everything that happens from here on in is going to talk about that transformation of consciousness that's possible. It's going to talk about resurrection. There's no Last Supper in John. The whole thing is the Last Supper. 
There's no Lord's Prayer. The whole thing is the Lord's Prayer. Yeah. As in heaven, so on earth. So uh, John is, in a sense, meditating on the life of Christ, meditating on these things. And as Stephen points out, it's almost difficult to say, is this the real, physical Christ talking, or is this the risen Christ talking? Is this before or after? <coughs> Get into this. See, you break the code and you begin to come to being itself. Because the other code word that Stephen explains is the I am. Ego in. I am the good shepherd. I am the true vine. Before Abraham was, I am. I am Moses, remember the burning bush? What is your name? Who shall I say will send me to liberate Israel? Say, I am. I am as I am. Say, I am. So this reaching back into the prehistory of the Jews, the liberation of Jew history, to making a claim about being that is unfolded on these third days, and then the possibility of transformation to anybody that's open to what's available. It's an extraordinary offer, an extraordinary claim to make. the realm of sort of, you know, putting self first, the realm of making our plans, the things we have to do to exist in life, the earthly stuff we have to get done. The heavenly realm is a realm of actually feeling that there's a love at the heart of the universe that cradles us and that we can have um, access to if we are able somehow just to stop for long enough to just exactly right, like the best wine, just exactly right. And that's one of the links with Buddhism, because Buddhism often misinterpreted because Buddhism, doesn't it, say no self? A lot of people go, well, I'm quite like Buddhism, but I don't like the no self business, because, you know, I am, I exist, I'm not quite my personality exists. What's all this about no self? Actually, Buddhism isn't really interested in what's called ontology, that is, what actually exists. It's interested in the process. So think verbs, not noun people. Think verbs and you get closer. Mindfulness is a noun. Think minded. And no self, that sounds like it's asserting something that doesn't exist. But think no selfing. In other words, it's a warning about always relating everything to ourselves. And it's saying watch out for relating everything to yourself. And not blaming yourself for it. Um, Ego is like the force of gravity. It's always going to be with us. We can't lay it aside, just like we can't lay aside gravity. But we can take it into account and see it in a bigger picture. So let's, I want to then come back to mindfulness and the research on mindfulness to, to help us answer some questions about what are the barriers to this transformation that follows. If both Buddhism and mindfulness over the years and uh, walking to Ryan offers a sense of transformation of consciousness. <coughs> what are the barriers? And I want to just uh, uh, outline um, three barriers that we want to be aware of. Uh, one is that we're always on the way to somewhere else. This <coughs> means we can't easily see the present. The second, I'm going to talk about where concepts stand in for experience. And the third I want to talk about is how we create stories in our heads often where I'm the star of the show, you know, I'm starring in my own show, and I'm directing it as well, you know, um, uh, and we create stories, and that is often a barrier to being in the just exactly now. So the first barrier then is the business that we're always on somewhere, we're always going somewhere else. Thich Nhat Hanh, the Vietnamese <coughs> teacher, has this lovely example of washing, washing dishes. And you, uh, imagine that you, you, know, you want to go shopping, but you think you'll have a cup of tea before you go, and then you discover that none of your cups and mugs are clean, so you've got to wash. So you, 
you wash the lap. But when, when you're washing up your cups and mugs, uh, your mind isn't really there because you're thinking about the cup of tea that you're going to have. So then you sit down, you make yourself a cup of tea. The question is, where is your mind when you're drinking the tea? Well, if you're going shopping, it's probably on the drive to the shops and whether you have petrol in your car or whether you should take a bike or whatever it happens to be. So five minutes later, you've drunk your tea and you think, oh, did I just drink that tea? I suppose I must have done because nobody else was around and the cup's empty. So you've missed the dishes and you've missed the tea. And then when you're driving, you're probably actually thinking of the shopping. And when you're shopping, you're thinking of the queuing. And when you're thinking of the queuing, you probably think, I should have been in another queue. Um, and, um, and then the person in front doesn't know the price of bread, so that stops you. And then there's the annoyance about that. And then you're thinking, what am I going to cook when I get home? And you've gone through the whole day believing it's the next moment. Because our minds are so good at planning. So good at planning that actually we often don't, we're not here for the simple, little things, even like the washing dishes. And the call is not for us to see washing the dishes as the best thing that ever happened. <laughs> you could do it if you wanted to. But just be here for it for one moment longer because actually that's as much part of your life as anything else. That's as much part of your life as your holiday in Italy or you know, being with your grandchildren or whatever it is. That's as much part of your life. And that's the part that's just gone. And then the tea's just gone. And then the drive's just gone. And the shopping's just gone. And the danger is that we wake up in six weeks to live in our life and look back on our life as if it's the empty cup. And we think, oh, well, was that my life? And I've just lived it. And I don't think it was anybody else's. It was mine. But it's disappeared. So there's a call that Thich Nhat Hanh says to wake up, to just check in and actually realize that we're alive. Joseph Campbell, the great expert on myth, who died in the 80s, he had this lovely expression um, that people say they're looking for the meaning of life, he said, but I don't think that's really what they're looking for. I think that what people are seeking is the experience of being alive. Because if you're looking for the meaning of life, you can get so wound up in thinking that actual life passes you by as you search for the meaning of what is your life. So maybe just for a minute, we can uh, just check in with another mindfulness practice where we focus now not just on ourselves, the food, but on our breathing. So this is traditionally used in uh, many, many meditation traditions of Christian and So again, the feet flat on the floor. And aware of the body sitting Shoulders can be dropped to face the lap. And just tuning in to this sitting. Noticing the weather pattern in your mind and body right now. Just acknowledging the chances and chances. Remaining here, just 
staying in this one place. Now I'm wanted, coming back to this place. Just abiding there. Sometimes the mind goes away for a long time, sometimes just for a few instances. But however long it goes for, it's hard to sustain. It's lived, it's gone, you bring it back. This is the practice. We're not trying to clear the mind. The practice is the mind will go and we can simply bring it back. to just focus on the breath in the nostrils. Nothing else. That's all we did for a weekend. <laughs> and the, the message was always the same, just coming back, staying here, just to bring it back. And at first you think, oh no, I can't do this, I can't do this. Then you realise actually there's no can or can't. It's just the mind will go, bring it back. It's like training an intentional muscle. It's just like you go to the gym and you just gently do this, but you don't just wave your hand, you just push against something, it's called resistance training. So you need the mind wandering to help you to notice the mind's gone, to bring it back. It's all training for the attentional muscle. And we know the brain changes when we do this. Um, but they had talked about staying and remaining, abiding. And having um, been on that, I had to take a service in a church uh, a little while afterwards, and it was on part of St. John's Gospel. Um, and I knew about this multi-layeredness of St. John from reading the Water and the Wine. And it was the part of St. John, which is the opening scene, the dramatic opening scene, at which Jesus walks onto the stage, as it were, for the first time. Um, there are some of John the Baptist's disciples following him. They subsequently become his followers, um, following him, and he turns around and he says, what do you see? Um, and they say, Master, where are you staying? He says, come and see. And the rest of the gospel is not come and see it. Um, but it's interesting, when they say, where are you staying? You know, I read it always as, where are you staying? You know, are you staying at Holiday Inn? Or are you staying uh, are you staying with friends? But the word staying is the same word that's later used for abiding. I mean, it's the same word. And as Stephen Burney points out, abiding is one of these key words. The dwelling and in the end, the whole, when you unwrap St. John's Gospel, it's all about abiding, mutual indwelling. So the sense of where are you abiding isn't just where are you staying, it certainly means that, but no word is ever one level of meaning in John. It's always where are you abiding, what are you about? What is it you're doing here? Come and see. So this multi-layeredness is very useful, and it was the first time I really to see that the mindfulness as taught by Buddhists might be really helpful in allowing us to see and experience the depth of meaning in the texts that we normally just read as words. And that's the second barrier, I think, is using words just as sort of concepts, which can prevent us getting underneath words to the experience. This is Joseph Campbell's quote about the experience of being alive being different from the meaning of life. I'm grateful for my colleague Gerald Rasmussen, who's an expert in, in philosophy and theology, for pointing out 
some little-known lectures that William James, a philosopher and psychologist, gave in Oxford in 1908. Um, and just a couple of years before he died, the Hibbert Lecture, available now on the, um, uh, the Gothenburg uh, Press uh, Podcast. And William James, as he so often did, intuited, um, I think, what was right and what was wrong about philosophy at this time. And he, uh, the, the lectures turned out to be a vitriolic attack on philosophy in Oxford uh, at the turn of the century, uh, because of a sort of Neoplatonist who believed that the essence of things, the truth of things, were best expressed by their names, by their concepts. And he wants to say, no, 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 no. Pure ideas and concepts will never really get you into the messiness of life, to really understanding what life is. Here's a couple of quotes. Instead of being interpreters of reality, concepts negate the inwardness of reality altogether. And thought deals solely with surfaces. It can name reality, but it cannot fathom it. Now, the thing about William James, because he's seen as one of the fathers of modern philosophy, he's also seen as one of the fathers of modern psychology. And in William James, his principles, experimental psychology, and certainly up into the 60s and 70s. Experiments were still being done that were showing that James was telling the truth. And there's one I came across just recently that I was going to tell you about. It's a, it's a, it's a study by some Swedish psychologists, um, and they were examining the phenomenon that you and I know very well, that sometimes smells are really good at evoking memory. You, know, you might be passing a shop and you smell fresh bread, and it takes you back to your childhood virtually act nothing like sex. Or you might smell mulled wine and it takes you back to, I don't know, your student days maybe. Um, maybe that's all a blank thereafter. But there's a sort of, there are these smells that take us back. And what you can simulate these with giving the names as well. If I just say to you clothes, people seem to go, you know, oh yeah, I know what that smells like. Or um, coal tar soap. My wife and I have something about coal tar soap. I used to love coal tar soap. Um, when we first met, I was a great one for coal tar soap, and I stank to high heaven, I think, of coal tar. Um, anyway, she soon cured me of that um, and other things. Um, so, you know, so you can give people these little things, and people come up with memories. If I say coal tar soap or, or clothes or mulled wine, you can come up with things. Now, the interesting thing is this. If you give people the actual smell or the name to smell, you'd have a different sort of pattern in the brain. So the actual smell gives pure memories, but they're older, more emotional, and people feel it all coming back. Whereas the names do bring memories, there's more of them, but they're sort of more surface memories, just like James said. The names only come back the surface of things, give you more, but less detail, less emotional. But this is what this study did very cleverly. Rather than just compare names with the actual smell, they actually had a third condition in which they gave both the actual smell and showed people the names of them. The question was, which would win? And it turned out, really surprisingly, that having the name for the smell completely wiped out the effect of having the real smell itself. The word trumped the experience. People got more memories, but they weren't so emotional, and they weren't so old. So it's really interesting that the, the word, the concept, is useful because we get more information, but it doesn't, as James said, fathom the depths. And there are clinical conditions, I and mean, one of them is anorexia, for example, in which words, the idea of your body, stands in for the experience of your body. So you think that people with an eating disorder, must, they're so over-focused on their body, but they're over-focused on the idea realm, not on the actuality of the experience of the body. You see people going to a mindful yoga class and say, oh, I felt my tummy for the first time. Is quite incredible. And people are beginning to examine now, can mindfulness get underneath the radar of this control system through ideas to a much more sort of messy but actual present moment, the actuality of the present moment, to get the transformation that comes when you get underneath the, uh, the surface of words to the actuality of the experience. So the third barrier, once you get into ideas, once your ideas have sort of gone up once you've gone upstairs, as it were, into the head, 
then it's really easy to live in the head all the time. And to not realize that that's what's happening. And that's the third barrier to transformation. And um, the reason is because the, the, the mind is too clever by half, in a sense. It's enormously clever. It's an it's evolutionary achievement uh, like nothing else. And it's enabled humans to build pyramids and send men to the moon and put wheels on suitcases. Um, but it seems to want to do everything. It seems to enjoy it. And one of the, to go back to the ship hole example, so that us, he and I standing there, having just rescued his bag, so everything was okay. But still, he and I knew that we would be plagued, let me tell you, that's perhaps too strong, but that we would be always thinking, what if? What if there'd been somebody standing there? What if a train was about to come in? It's really interesting that in clinical, um, in our clinical work, the what ifs are sometimes as bad as the reality. So if you have somebody who's been through a horrible traffic accident, for example, then memories or flashbacks of that that can happen in post-traumatic stress disorder are really bad. Um, but interestingly, there's another sort of torture that people <coughs> have, which is the what ifs. So if somebody survives an accident, they often will say, what if I'd been killed? What would happen to my family? What would happen to my children? And they can be equally tortured by the what if that didn't happen as the memories and flashbacks of things that did. Um, I, talk, I was walking down Oxford High Street a couple of weeks ago and I met, bumped into a friend of mine that I hadn't seen for 18 months. And, and uh, I said, oh, how are you? I said, brightly. And she said, I'm fine. And I thought, oh, oh. What have I missed? She said, don't you know? I said, no. She said, well, I will write to you and tell you what's happened to me. But in summary, I fell off a mountain. We were climbing in Snowdon on the Snowdonia in Trevon. And um, he looked down a gully to see if he could climb down. Decided he couldn't, but before he got back, the wind had come up and a gust had taken him. And he fell 160 dashed his head, broke this, broke that, and um, fortunately fell onto a ledge. And amazingly found his mobile phone was still in his pocket, and even more amazingly that there was signal halfway up the mountain. In fact, it turns out it's not an accident. That's what the, the rescue people have tried to guarantee in Snowden because it happened so often. Um, he could have his signal because he wasn't expected everywhere, and he thought, this is the end of my life. But he had the signal, he was able to phone in a helicopter, came to pick him up, and he recuperated. Uh, the first of all, in his buddy Gwyneth in, uh, in Bangor, um, the hospital, the Gwyneth Hospital, and then um, in his uh, hometown in the West Midlands. Um, so, what if? What if? The whole thing about the what if that is in my last word. But it doesn't need to be huge things like such a trauma. It can be, uh, if only, if only I hadn't said that nasty word. If only I hadn't got angry. What if, if it happened, that happened? You know, we can torture ourselves, even if we've said something bad to someone or done something to people. Um, even if we said sorry, we can still be tortured by the, I shouldn't have done that, by the wishing it hadn't happened. These are called counterfactuals, by the way, if you want the technical term for them. Counterfactual reasoning. Reasoning about something that didn't actually happen. And historians do this all the time. What if Hitler had invaded Britain, for example? We get television programs on this. Interestingly, counterfactuals are not random. We don't, historians don't say, what if the Romans had had machine guns? Yeah. <laughs> it has to be plausible. Um, if we fall in the street, we don't say, oh, I wish there wasn't gravity. If only there wasn't gravity, I would have been fine. <laughs> but you might say, I wish I wasn't wearing these shoes, so then you might go off on or perhaps I'm so clumsy, depending on your mood. And that's the point. Plausible counterfactuals, the way your mind will run, is dependent on what feels plausible, and your mood determines what feels plausible. So if you're feeling sad, it's I only I hadn't done that. If you're feeling uh, bad about something, that will generate lots of those only, like bubbles coming up out of a, you know, an electric kettle boil, so bubbles coming up. So the counterfactuals, the what ifs, and if only comes. And because the mind is so good at generating them, we 
created this evil. And they compound our moods and block our ability to be in the present moment. Um, in a really uh, uh, bad and uh, uh, destructive way. And so maybe we'll do a third meditation before um, I say some concluding remarks, in which maybe we allow ourselves to sit there and if anything comes to mind that's difficult, see if it's possible to allow it to remain on the workbench of the mind, rather than pushing it away as we so often do, but to notice where it is in the body, what's it doing to our body, and see if in the body we can hold it gently, making space for it, rather than chasing it away. I'll give you some instructions and guidance as we sit, but that's the see if you can hold it in the larger space. doing its thing. It's what the mind does. That's what we trained it to do, to generate lots of what-ifs and if onlys to help us solve problems. So it's not a mistake when the mind does that. It's noticing when the mind is serving us and helping us, and when it's just put the wheels under and it's skidding away on its own agenda, only to, to bring it back. So we practice bringing it back. Noticing when it's gone away and bringing it back. So we're training the mind to notice when the mind goes, when the attention goes off. And then to bring it back to this sitting here, this sitting, breathing being. the mind will go off onto unpleasant things, unresolved things, arguments, failures, disappointments. And if it is doing so, maybe instead of just rapidly coming back to the body, see where it's affecting the body, if it is at all. There might be some contraction somewhere. in the body associated with this difficulty. And if you notice something in the body, simply bringing attention to the body, the place where this feeling is most intense, and cradling it gently in awareness, not trying to change it or get rid of it, simply cradling it in awareness giving it space, allowing it to be just as it is in this moment. A sense of friendliness is also <coughs> compassion. And if nothing is coming to mind and you want to experiment with this, then Feeling free perhaps even to, to bring to mind a, a small difficulty, not the biggest thing in your life. Some small difficulty. And as it comes into your mind, notice what happens to the body. Is there any contraction, holding, sense of clutching? Thank you. 
go of trying to work things out through the mind, the sense that actually somewhere in this being that actually is more spacious, which is holding awareness, which is almost waiting for us to let go of our attempts to problem solve everything and just hold cravingly in this compassionate awareness is at the heart of mindfulness, which can sound very cold in dealing with our deepest fears with compassion and being able to hold them with more steadiness than we might have thought possible. And in that holding, it, they tend to transform themselves without us doing anything or appearing to do anything. And that's where the mindfulness seems to meet up with the transformation that Stephen Gray is talking about in Walk of the Mind. Because there he's talking about a similar sort of allowing coming back to the present moment, again and again, to see the best one, to see the transformation of consciousness that's possible, when you let go of the sort of the, the selfing tendency that, well, I can do, I can work this out, and just surrender to that present moment. Surrendering, as he says, to love, the life through death that he talks about in the book. And so the practical implications of both water into wine and and their possible tie-up are, are legion. And this is the beginning of a voyage of discovery for all of us, not the end or the middle. We can identify the times, if nothing else, where our mind has got the truth on. And just maybe even smile at the mind, rather than say, oh, well, I've got to, I've got to bring the mind back. Maybe just smile at the antics of the mind. And hold, you know, have, have a couple of minutes of friendship right now, because the mind is going. So that's a, a right now moment. Mindfulness doesn't mean that you have to stop remembering and stop planning, you know, living in the present moment. Like, oh, how could I live in the present moment? I've thought about tomorrow. That's fine. It's planning, knowing that you're planning. <coughs> it's remembering, knowing that you're remembering. So you're remembering and planning in this present moment of just exactly now, as Stephen talks about in his book. You can experience every time you're locked in your head when you're sleeping. Sleep is a great time rather than can't sleep. It's a great time to practice. Because there's nothing else to do. Nobody else is up. So, and nobody knows you're doing it. So that's fine. But then, practice then when your mind is doing all this da, 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 of actually just putting your attention in terms of truth and working up in terms of truth. I bet you won't be feeling that. Why? Because the mind will either get involved and say, oh, hang on, my mind's getting involved again. Back in terms of truth. Do that again and again. Back in terms of truth. Start moving up the body. Oh, mind's got involved again, back in terms of truth, and see what happens. The mind has got an amazing job. It does a job of keeping things together all the little times you're awake. So you end up saying, I didn't get a wink of sleep. <laughs> but actually, we will get more sleep in your case. It's just the mind connects the dots, puts them all together, and doesn't notice the time in your sleep, because why would it? The mind's not there. But it connects all the dots and then tells you you haven't had enough time. Um, so it's quite a good idea to practice Mindfulness, yes, it's good to find a time each day when you can practice just for mindfulness' sake. But it's very pragmatic. You can use it for when you can't sleep at night as well. Um, why not? So, coming to the end of uh, this lecture and just about to be open to questions. But in summary, I think mindfulness is this ancient spiritual practice which has been released into the current generation because it's been secular and they don't have to become tainted with the sort of religious thing. They can just dwell where people are in terms of their quest for spirituality. But nevertheless, all the people who 
teach mindfulness are expected to go on retreats themselves, to practice themselves, so that when they go to a mindfulness teacher, they have something of the authentic tradition that comes over the two and a half thousand years. But there are, believe it or not, lots of churches that exist in our towns and cities and villages, which are sacred spaces and have been sometimes for generation after generation, often neglected sacred spaces, where people over the generations have gone to find exactly this art of stillness, where people have gone to find the waters of art and get below the words, below the concepts, below the what ifs, uh, to find uh, resurrection, to it, to find resurrection. And the extraordinary thing is to have research showing that that quest is worthwhile, that it can actually transform uh, people's lives as evaluated by the clinical or the clinical trials that the government find useful. And so the government recommends mindfulness now on the basis of this research. But our research actually also shows it's not enough to be enthusiastic about mindfulness. You have to actually practice it. Sorry. <laughs> um, we've actually done research showing that few, some people start off very enthusiastic but don't practice and then they don't get the benefit. Some people start off very skeptical but actually do the practice and they get the benefits. So it's really important. And to leave behind the idea that we're always getting somewhere else, we're always getting somewhere else, and see if we can be exactly in the now. And then having the stability to turn towards what most fears us, knowing that as we get nearer the light, the shadow will appear larger. So I'll finish with this poem, just a part of a poem by R.F. Thomas. Part of a poem called Apostrophe by R.F. Thomas, in which he also, rather like Stephen likes and John, subverts an old idea. This is what R.F. Thomas says. There are no journeys, I tell them. Love turns on its own axis, as do beauty and truth. And the wise are they who, in every generation, remain still to assess their nearness to it by the magnitude of their shadow. Another interesting uh, phenomenology phenomena is um, an uncoupling of the parts of the brain that normally are coupled together. So, for example, when we were focusing on our body just now, if we scanned your brains, there'd be a part of the brain called the insula, part of the cortex, um, which takes all the information from the surface of the body and also the viscera and the inside of the body and computes it, then send messages to the, to the cortex. So it's a bit of a wave station for the sense of body sensation. And um, it's turned on with negative moods, positive moods, but it always, when it turns on, tends to activate the cortical structures responsible for self-related thinking. They're very tightly bound. And that's what you see at the beginning of a mindfulness course. They activate one, the other one. So if you get people focused on their body, the mind starts churning up as well with thoughts about itself. After a mindfulness course, they're uncoupled. 
So you can get activity here and activity here, but they're not so close to touch. It gives people the, sort of the, the ability to focus on their body and the ability to think, but not necessarily that one should immediately activate the other. So it gives people sleepless and associated with people having more courage. So there's a couple of things that change in your brain uh, when you practice mindfulness. Thank you. So the question which is, uh, in North America, uh, with meditation, they tend to uh, meditate for like two, three hours, sort of normal. And I find here, So um, it's, there may be cultural differences, but actually there are many people in America who do the one minute, 10 minute, half an hour as well. And some people here in this country who do the one hour, two hours a day. What we recommend is that people should, uh, if, if they come to us um, with serious clinical problems, we give them meditations and CDs they can take home, which tend to be about 35 minutes a day, and we ask them to do that for six days out of seven, for the eight weeks, and then decide what to do after. If people come to us just because they are feeling a bit busy and they want to find a bit of peace, then the meditation of the eight-week course, like in our book, Frantic World, the Finding Peace in a Frantic World, they tend to, we start with eight minutes twice a day, then 10 minutes, quarter an hour twice a day, and, and then you have the chance to put them together to make a 20-minute meditation if you want to. But all the meditations are uh, about 10 minutes. Um, and we see that as being a very good gateway in that people can use as a sort of starting off, and some people don't need anything else. That, for them, uh, already makes a big difference in their life. So it's really, uh, but the more practice you do, the better. We know that from the brain science, and the brain scientists who look at other forms of practice, like recovery from stroke, also say that you've got to keep on practicing it. Um, so uh, it's a bit like learning a foreign language, that if you learned it a long time ago and you haven't practiced it for, for a while, it's almost like you don't speak it at all. It does come back slightly easier if you want to learn it. But a few phrases a day are useful. And so the difficult thing that people find is actually making the time for it. So we tend to say, just go and do any amount, because zero, the difference between zero and one minute is bigger than the difference between one and five minutes. So just go to your special place and sit for a minute and then decide how long you want to stay there. You may find you want to get there for about three minutes, or you may find five or 10 minutes feel possible for you, or sometimes even longer. But not to give yourself a hard time because you're not meditating long enough, because actually that just is a sort of like a guilt trip. And it doesn't actually make you meditate for very long anyway. If it did, I'd say be guilty. Um, uh, but actually it doesn't seem to work. It didn't work for me anyway. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Just for ladies, what you were just saying, it strikes me that the, the, the inner experience to words and smells in that experiment. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, I think that there's something about net, if you just, our lives are so busy that actually we don't have time to meditate. That's, you know, none of us do. We don't have time to pray, we don't have time to meditate. Um, however, when we do find a little bit of time, there is a sort of sense of entry through a portal into another form of time that isn't clock time. Um, a nun uh, once referred to this is horticultural time. <laughs> horticultural time, because you know, if we stand and watch the flowers grow in clock time, we get very bored very quickly. Horticultural.
cultural time athlete is a wiser form of long-term time that does what it needs to do in the time that it would naturally take. So what's a cultural time athlete do for kids? And she uses in her book on mindful birthing, on, on how to be pregnant and have a child and then early parenting and really learn about what's a cultural time because what's happening in the woman's body is not clock time in one sense. It's something, it's something growing and called the cultural time and how to use that in the child birth process. And I think it's a wonderful, um, so thank you for that. Yeah. So it was a separate poem for your history and medical context. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you, sir. And indeed, I mean, in Water to Wine, I mean, everything's in this book. So do, do read it if you haven't. Um, the only decision you will have to read when you when have to make when you get Water to Wine is whether you read it at one go right through the night <coughs> or whether you just decide to do it sort of three pages at a time. <coughs> treasure up the next decision. That's the only decision you have to make. But he talks about um, the inrush of timelessness. Uh, the, the, what, a, a person to whom he's talking, uh, Sandy referred to this earlier, um, who said, I believe that at the end of my life, at the moment of my death, there'll be an inrush of timelessness. And so I think there's a sort of sense in which it refers not only to horticultural time, but when we're taken back into horticultural time and, 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 and released uh, and what comes experiences an inrush of timelessness. So I think time is a, is a beautiful um, metaphor for uh, the, the deeper reality. Thank you. So Can you just tell me about how to deal with anger? Yeah. <laughs> so anger's a hard one, isn't it? No, no. So the question is what about anger? I think of all the destructive emotions, that can be one of the bigger challenges. Um, there's a psychologist, Marsha Linehan, who uses this phrase and I many years ago in, in Cambridge, and she talks about her work in which she deals with uh, anger amongst other hugely um, destructive emotions. She talks about the need to put more synapses between impulse and action. So synapses, these connections in the brain, yeah? And she says that the problem with these strong emotions is that there's an action-reaction, there's something happens and we react just like that. Um, is it possible, she thought, and she trained people to be able to do this, because these people were also getting angry and losing their friends, but also attempting suicide and cutting themselves and doing horrible things. Could you have the moment of where you would normally react, see it clearly, just for that moment, and respond instead of react? Now, it takes quite a bit of practice, but one thing that <coughs> many people say who practice mindfulness is that one of the things they notice is they're not so reactive. Now, one of the things that virtually all spiritual writers have said over the centuries is after the greatest spiritual transformation in your life, you'll probably suddenly become aware of the greatest shadow. So, having, you know, so it's not a sort of promise that actually we will then get rid of all our anger and all our pain and all our suffering. Somebody wrote a book once that summarised in the title this thing. This, it, the book was called After the Ecstasy, the Laundry. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's the reality of our lives, that after the ecstasy, the laundry. So, but, but um, I mean, let me give you an example. There was a, 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 a lady who was learning to be a mindfulness teacher, so she's doing quite a lot of mindfulness. She came on a retreat with us to learn how to just do the mindfulness and to teach it. But she had to go away from the retreat uh, on one of the days to do something because it was unavoidable. And she decided when she was out uh, of the retreat to go and to pick up her son, her 15-year-old son, on skis. Um, and uh, because she hadn't seen him for the few days she'd been on the retreat. So there she was, she picked him up from school, he heaved himself into the car, as was he, as is his, his wont. And uh, uh, she said, well, how was your day? And he said, oh, mum, you're always asking that. <laughs> and she said, for that moment, normally, she would have whizzed her teeth, and I'm, I'm grateful, you know, <laughs> and just driven home in a temper, in sort of silence. But because she'd been doing, she said afterwards, because she's perhaps doing a lot of practice, she, as soon as her son said that, she felt immediately the sort of contraction inside. And in the seeing of this, you know, reactivity, there came just a moment, just an instant, where instead of reacting in one way, she just noticed that 
and found herself saying, somewhat to her surprise, I missed you. And she said afterwards, and it smiled at me, and that's the first time it smiled at me for three months. <laughs> so I think it was the combination of having done the mindfulness practice, quite a lot of mindfulness practice, where she did just to catch herself before the inevitable happened, and found something else happening. Much to her surprise, actually, it wasn't that she thought, right, I'm going to be really mindful here. <laughs> it just, it went off in a different, and that was enough. And I think that's possible. I've seen it in my classes again and again, that people, the person at work they always get frustrated with, uh, somewhere halfway through a mindfulness class, they say, I saw him in the corridor today, and you know, I just thought he looked so sad. Whereas normally, I just can't sit down and look at him. And the sort of seeing the sadness in the face transformed the situation, and it didn't feel so herself. It didn't seem curious, but it's a sort of it's a possibility that actually it doesn't have to just follow the old habits and the old mental grooves. Yeah. Yes. what you're doing, you might as well be doing that. <laughs> yeah. Yes. But I mean, yeah. do you think it's something that could be relevant to younger children? Yes. Like yes. I mean, this is little children. Yeah. yeah, my eight-year-old grandson practices sometimes, especially when he can't get to. He'll pad downstairs sometimes, I'm looking after him, and say, can I have a body scan? <laughs> <laughs> And the scary 
any distance from those outer bits. And for some people, it's so scary, they say, no, I don't want to And that's fine too. Yeah. So, but for kids, they seem to really, really like it. So what we did, they call prop box. Prop box. Feet on the floor, thumb on chair. <laughs> prop box. And even in this junior school in North Wales, they have introduced it in, uh, in eight, nine, ten-year-olds. Um, on one windy, gusty day, when all the kids have been outside, and you know if any of you teachers, what happens in the class when it's windy outside. Mm -hmm. They all come in and they're all over the place, and the child says, can we take a prop box, please, sir? <laughs> Susan Burgos in Amsterdam has now done quite a bit of research on ADHD and also um, fairly high functioning Asperger's autism spectrum disorder and found it's very useful. She has the parents and the children. They have a first class together, then they have separate classes graded, then they come together at the end. And she encourages them if they want to to meditate with their mum and dad because actually the mum and dad can't do it just as easily as just as well as the children. So some of the children have to show them what to do. Says, just, just relax, just do it, just do it. And so it's quite good to have them meditate together. But she's getting very good results, as good as any other psychological student who's a very fine uh, behavioral cognitive psychologist. Um, and um, she's finding as results as good with this um, as with anything she's ever tried before for that population, even teenagers. Um, and often the parent views, which a lot of people think have ADHD, the parents often say, you know what, I have attention problems too. Um, and, uh, and the parents say, oh, I want those, and she offers them for them as well. Thank you. So there's a hand up over there. Yeah, I just want to ask, um, at the end of a, uh, a session of education where you did the sequence of evolution, or you did one of the stage you see when you see the computer mm. series, there's a, a first person view uh, of your thought process. If at the end of that process, um, you're, you've got unsolicited anxieties that, that crop up anyway, that you yeah. hadn't thought yeah. about before, they become present and they become real, and then suddenly you're almost more anxious before uh, after the, the meditation than you were during it. So you end up sometimes quite unsatisfied at the experience of that meditative process yeah. because your mind's desire to seek some sort of resolution. <coughs> to, I just wonder, well, is that a common experience? If it is, I just wonder what your thoughts are on how to handle that kind of meditative experience. Okay, so it's a good question. What happens if it's actually you're, you're so set on resolving something that isn't resolved, so at the end of the meditation you end up more anxiety with more unfinished business than there appears to be beforehand. So one of the things is there is, well, what we say is just carry on doing it, yeah? Because often, um, uh, you know, the next day you have a different experience. So if one just had to learn either from a really good sitting, oh, that's fantastic, that's something that I want to learn, or a really bad sitting. So you gradually, and there's no such thing as a good or bad sitting, it's just notice things. And we get a little better over time in noticing when the weather pattern of the mind just ends up being stormier and fierce at the end of our sitting than at the beginning. And being able to sit a bit lighter about saying, okay, that's fine. Interestingly, even on those occasions, very often the experience is later on in the day when something happens, something different happens from what would have normally happened. So that even when you think, oh, it's a bad hour, oh, it can't be doing me any good, it turns out that later on in the day, something happens, you think, oh, I, I would never have dreamt that I would have thought of saying that to that person. So that something seems to have happened by virtue of the being awareness. But conversely, as I said, you might have sat there thinking, oh, this is a great thing, oh, this is bliss, this is bliss, then you go downstairs and the cat's done something on the carpet, and suddenly you are, you are your old self again. <laughs> oh, I never wanted that cat in the first place, it's all your fault. And, you know, so it's really good to just take it when we find that it's like that. And just keep, keep at it. Thank you. We, we, I'm, I'm going to look at Brad here. Do you want to, when do you want to call time? I'm too happy to talk, but a few more minutes to go. So what do you think? Yeah. Well, that's a, a maximum of another five minutes. A maximum of another five minutes, okay. So yeah. let's take some, two or three questions to see if they can be rolled in. So here and then at the back. Let's do a few things. On some occasions you said we, um, presumably referring to your colleagues in your department. Is there anybody amongst those colleagues who would wish to be described as a materialist and diehard atheist amongst your colleagues in your department? Yeah, yeah. So that's, let's hold on to that question. Just 
question from the back as well. We can have a bunch of questions for you. Thank you. Yes, my, mine was more a comment yeah. than a question. Because um, I'm really interested in the way you related mindfulness to the New Testament teachings. And it occurs to me that the, the core of the New Testament teaching is what's called the good news, which actually has got three components. One of which is time the time has come for men. So it's now. And then the kingdom of, of God is at hand, so it's here. Yeah. And the way to this, the word in Greek is metanoia, yeah. is actually about going beyond the mind, it's going beyond identification of the mind. Mm -hmm. And that seems to be exactly what you're, you're, uh, what you're talking about. Yeah, well, I hoped it was, <laughs> but who can tell? I'm not a theologian, I'm doing the best I can with one of the best guys I can, but thank you for pointing that out, and that is absolutely just exactly now. And then relating that to the atheist question is really good. Indeed, uh, there are some of my colleagues who describe themselves as material atheists, and one of the um, tasks that even I, who was brought up in the Christian tradition and I'm ordained uh, painter and priest, um, have set myself is to try to ensure that mindfulness is always available to people of all faiths and none through the sense that mindfulness itself should be what Richard Dawkins said it should be moved into, which was secular spirituality. That, that, um, that it should be stripped of anything that would get in the way of people being able to have available to them uh, something which would be potentially um, transformative without them having to buy in to something which they would call religion. Um, and and that's why we tend not to use any Buddhist words, not even the word sati, in a mindfulness class. Not that we want to hide the fact that it comes from the Buddhist tradition, although it's in every tradition, but because actually, if it's a universal, I mean, the Buddhists, what, they, what the Buddhists bequeath to us is not a set of truths, but a set of, of hypotheses. The hypotheses, which at the end of all the Buddhist scriptures says, now go and find out for yourself, um, these hypotheses were, if you practice this and this path, then you discover this, and uh, the sort of suffering that you're co-creating all the time. And that, that is a universal and secular message, indeed, as the early Buddhists were against the sort of Brahmin, the cup, and the idea of the four noble truths, or the four ennobling truths, were that normally in those days, you were noble by your birth, and the historical Buddha said, no, no, you're noble by your practice and the way you live your life. Um, so it was a secular movement sense, and, and then became a, a faith-based religious movement, but in those days they didn't discriminate sex from sexual movement. But I sense there's a question inside your question. Would you like to unbottle it and... Well, uh, uh, only that um, you, you, are, you are an audience speaker, to be fair. Yeah. And, and so I'm making this up. I'm a Christian. <laughs> Presumably. Um, I, and, and I'm, I'm an Anglican, you're not a Christian. <laughs> <laughs> and and you, sp you spoke at the beginning of this yeah. distinction between spiritual and yeah. religious. Um, mm. suggesting possibly that in order to, be, to have uh, the most fruitful experience of mindfulness you should have to open yourself to a, to a spiritual dimension mm. which is something which if I were uh, an atheist I yeah. would be unable to do right. yeah. absolutely so one of the things then is to just unpack the word spiritual and in virtually all I mean because we tend to think of mind, body, spirit um, or body, mind, spirit you know, we know where the body is, we know where the mind is Spirit is a sort of six inches above the mind. We tend to sort of you know, parse ourselves like that. And then to reach the spirit, you often have this idea of you know, ascending stairs or so on. Um, and so we get lost in the words we use about it. In large ways, as Susan explains in the book, we start taking the word literally. If you think of spirit as being the core of who we really are, when we are at our most whole, then I think it changes the metaphor in, in a much more helpful and that even atheists can, can <coughs> intuit the core of who they really are when they're at their most whole. And even if you take a materialist view of the brain, when they're in their labs, they won't take a materialist view, I hope, of their wives or of husbands when they're at home or their partners. It'll be a sort of sense of joining at this, making something even more whole in a partnership, rather than sort of, you know, let's unite our brains together. So there's a sort of sense in which that vocabulary, I think, can help. And who you are when you're at your most whole. Um, and the 
journey to realize that, in a sense, we're already there, but we get in our own way a lot of the time. How can we get out of our own way? That, I think, is where we are for me. And that, I think, is a universal message. I hope it is. Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark.